All right, so this is August, uh, Sunday, August 23rd. I mean, a discussion on pilgrimages, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Anchorage, Kentucky. And um, you guys still see the screen, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah, Mount Athos. Are, are you, is everybody here familiar with Mount Athos? No. Okay, cool. So Mount Athos is a, um, they call it the Holy Mountain. It's an Eastern Orthodox pilgrimage. Uh, it is a site with uh, several monasteries. Um, it's been there for over a thousand years. Um, get this advanced marker here. So it has been a monastic community since 963. The first wow. monastery was established there by Saint Athanasius. Uh, he established the monastery of Great Lavra, which is still there, by the way. Uh, it's still the largest and most prominent of the 20 monasteries that is on that mountain. And it has been protected by uh, emperors uh, through the centuries. Uh, of course, Greece was part of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire when uh, Rome basically functionally split into two. And, we talk about Rome falling, uh, but the Byzant Byz Byzantine Empire continued on for about a thousand years after that, uh, what is now considered Turkey. Uh, and um, this was a part of that uh, political structure, the Eastern Roman Empire, or what we refer to as Byzantium. Interesting, interestingly enough, they didn't call themselves the Byzantine Empire. That is something modern historians have termed them. Uh, they consider themselves the Roman Empire, even though Rome proper had fallen by that time. So this is, um, oh, let me turn on my, uh, let me turn on my little laser pointer here. We can figure out how to do that. <laughs> So yeah, so this this outline region here, you see, it's, it's almost an island um, off of Greece, and it's very fairly sizable. And that is that is Mount Athos, and that is a protected holy mountain. Um, it's a self self governed state, uh, part of the uh, part of the nation of Greece. Um, it's uh, subject to the laws of Greece as a nation and to the ecumen ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. And they have representatives in the um, Grecian nation. Uh, they have a governor of Mount Athos. And here's a, here's a layout of all the different monasteries. Wow. Oh. Now it is it is a very orthodox. It is strictly orthodox. It is Eastern Orthodox um, site. Uh, they allow limited visitors, 100 Orthodox people per day, and 10 non-Orthodox people. So you got to sign up in advance and get tickets. And uh, 10 of us could go, but no more than 10. So not Orthodox. And even the Orthodox are limited to 100 per day. So it's, it's Considering how many monasteries there are and the size of the place, that's a very small number of people that are allowed to visit daily. Dave? Yeah. How, how big is that piece of land? It's, uh, you know, I, I don't have a number for you, but it's pretty huge. I mean, if we back it looks up. looks big. Yeah. I mean, back up to the opening screen, that, that's a picture of the mountain. And that's, that's not the whole thing. So it's pretty sizable. Thank you. There's, there's, uh, I don't know, even know how many monasteries. Each of those little symbols there is a monastery. So there's several, and along with the monastery, there's there's organizations called skite, which are uh, communities attached to the monastery, uh, and there's also several monast uh, solitary hermitages. So it's it's fairly sizable. Um, Mount Athos is considered uh, a center of Eastern Christian Orthodox monasticism. 
they call it the Holy Mountain in the Orthodox tradition. It's, it's very revered and honored as a, a very uh, central place of spirituality. Many of their bishops and priests come out of there. Uh, a lot of their teachings come out of there. So it's, it's a very central focus in the Orthodox world. Um, and like I said there, the, uh, as an institution, it is and has been a standard bearer of Orthodox Christianity. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? So according to tradition, uh, they teach that Virgin Mary went there with John the Evangelist on their way to visit Lazarus in Cyprus, and they encountered a stormy a sea that forced them to temporarily seek refuge in the port. Um, and um, because of that event, it became significant to them, and they established a monastery there where, where uh, the Virgin Mary and John the Evangelist landed. There's a picture of it during the day. Yeah. I have a question. Can I interrupt you yes. for a second? Yes, yes, yes. So where would, <clears throat> in regards to where Mary lived, how would she have gotten there? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's not that, so you know, away. it's all on the Mediterranean Sea, you know, I mean, it's just uh, Greece is on the northern aspect of the Mediterranean Sea and, and you know, J Jerusalem and Israel, right. southern aspect. So it's just, it's just across the sea. It, I mean, it, you could get there in less than a day in a boat ride. And, and we do, we do know the disciples went all over the, I mean, it is it's amazing when you look at where the disciples went. And the apostles, the 12 apostles went after the death of Jesus. And not only did they go all over Africa and the Middle East uh, and all over the Roman Empire, but they went further than that. You know, they went all the way to India uh, and China and uh, um, England. You know, that's a long trek. It sometimes blows me away, and I don't know how in the world they did that with their technology and, you know, by boat and foot. It amazes me. So I... Well, the Roman, the Roman would be a what's that? system. Yeah, there is, the Roman interstates, if you will. The, I mean, they built fantastic roads connecting all the land they control. So yeah, that right. Helped them a lot in regards to <clears throat> where, where the Roman roads. Were. I wonder I, if there's any written record of Mary going there. I don't think there's any written. I think this is this is Eastern Orthodox tradition that they've taught. Um, I, I, most of the traditions of the church are probably true. You know, the stories that are passed down word, sure. word of mouth through generations. Certainly things get exaggerated. And, and you think, you think uh, Joseph minded Mary going around, you know, around with uh, this other guy? I mean, this uh, doesn't, that sounds sort of weird to me. Well, so, probably, I, I, I'm thinking dead by then. He, yeah, who knows? But I, I think he probably didn't. I think this was such a phenomenal event, what happened. I think they recognized Jesus was the son of God, and this was a, a brand new religion dawning on the world. And it, it just changed the normal rules and standards of, of expectations of society. I think, I think he probably didn't mind. And I think he's probably in favor of also spreading the church, you know, of, of launching this brand new uh, religious experience in the world. So I'm thinking- That makes sense. So all, all the monasteries are communes. Um, by the way, Jen, if the rest of us go uh -huh. to pilgrimage, I'm sorry to tell you, you can't go. They don't allow any women. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. Even if, even if I have a, a fake beard on and, and have stayed dressed like that? <laughs> you, you can try. I don't know. I don't know what you're <laughs> I'm thinking their viewpoint on transgender is probably pretty conservative, so. <laughs> she, okay. She can borrow David's mustache. He's got plenty to give. <laughs> Look at that. These are wonderful photos. Wow. They are. <clears throat> I don't know if I like living that close to the edge of something. Oh, right. Especially, especially if you sleepwalk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, there's a few earthquakes run, rumble around there too. I yeah, guess right. About, the, the island, well, not the island, but the peninsula is about 20 miles long and maybe two and a half miles wide. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. That's pretty big. It is pretty big, yeah. Yeah. That is beautiful right it there. It is, yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Dave, got his coffee. 20 <laughs> monasteries. Yeah, I think he went to the whole about 20 monasteries. <laughs> about 20 monasteries and the big and largest one. Do we have any idea what the enrollment of those places are? I mean, do they have 10? Yeah, do they have 10 monks in each one of them? Or do we know how many people they're housing? I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. How many religious people? Well, there's a lot of so solitary. Uh, places that you know people live by themselves but there are the communes as well so i don't know and, and when you talk about smell they also do a lot of they do they basically produce their own food which means they have uh not only are they planting you know garden vegetables but they have sheep and other animals so i just looked it up there's the population of mount athos is 1811 really? 1811 people as 1, 000, that's 1811 wow as of 2011 Oh yeah, well, I probably, I mean, it's pretty tightly regulated. It's probably not much difference. Yeah, that's not very many people, is it? No, no. Well, no wonder they only allow, uh, what's that? Oh, I just said wonderful architecture, I love it. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah. So you, you, if, 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 so we get a pass, it's a four day pass um, and you take a ferry boat in the morning to go across. Um, and you spend four days there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, have y'all been, have y'all been inside an Orthodox church at all? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this, this is what the interior of an Orthodox church looks like. Their walls are completely covered in uh, icons. Mm -hmm. It is pretty incredible. All right. So, like I might have mentioned before, I know the first few pilgrimages we did, we spent a couple of days on each one, but I'm doing a little short uh, covering these more briefly in the next few. So, that was it for Mount Athos. So, so they don't let women. So I guess Mary was the last woman to. <laughs> <laughs> she must have made a good impression for them to be in women. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah, that's... It probably helped her being, her being the mother of Jesus. Yeah. There, there are a um, three Roman Catholic pilgrimages that all have to do with appearances of Mary, so Marian apparitions. And I find these really fascinating. These are all pilgrimages I've heard of and didn't really know what they were until I started studying for this class here. Um, you know, you've probably all heard of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, do, you, do you guys know the story between Our Lady of Guadalupe? Uh, you might need to refresh our memory. Yeah, well, don't you... Mexico. I didn't know I didn't know the stories behind any of these until I started looking it up for this class. So the three of them are Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Lourdes, and Our Lady of Fatima. And these are all based on Mary appearing to people. Um, and then, of course, you end up building a chapel that falls into a basilica eventually. So the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe takes place in Mexico. And there was this uh, poor Mexican farmer named Juan. And he was sitting on a hill. And he heard this beautiful music. And a radiant cloud appeared. And within the cloud, there was a woman. And to him, she, she looked like an Aztec princess and spoke to him in his Aztec language. And that was in 1531. Of course, later it was, de you know, determined that it was, that was the Virgin Mary. She told him to build a chapel, 
And she appeared to Juan four times and once to his uncle. Naturally, he goes and talks to the bishop about this. And the, uh, the bishop tells Juan, well, whoever this lady is you're talking to, she needs to give you some sort of a sign. And so the next time uh, she appeared to Juan, uh, Mary told him to collect roses in his cloak. So he gathered up a bunch of roses and brought them to the bishop. And he dropped all the roses on the bishop's floor and this is the image that appeared inside his cloak. Which, uh, you know, if it's true, <laughs> pretty mind blowing. Uh, so that is the story behind Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, naturally, it developed into a church and eventually a, um, a basilica. And one of the most popular Roman Catholic pilgrimages Still, wow. there are million, millions of people visit Our Lady of Guadalupe annually. Probably not in 2020, of course, but normally they get millions per year. The blue building, what is that? Copper. That is the Basilica. Well, I believe this is the Basilica of um, Our Lady of Guadalupe. This building here is, is the one where people go visit. This is probably an older one. I don't really know for sure. I, th I think it's the site where Juan presented his robe to the bishop. Okay. So if you wanted to go, go there, would you, where would you fly into? Guadalupe or Mexico City? Or do you know yeah, where I, I think it's a, the, Yeah, I think you would fly into Mexico City. Yeah. Um, I think it's in Mexico City, if I'm, if I'm correct. Most, there's a big city behind it. Yeah. Are you looking it up, Rob? Yeah. Uh, in Mexico oh, very City. Useful. It is. Okay, I thought it was Mexico City, yeah. All right, so Our Lady, Our Lady of Lords, which is in France. Uh, this is where um, a young woman named Bernadette Subaru was born in 1844. And by the way, my wife's uh, church that she attends with her family is, is St. Bernadette's here in uh, Louisville. And that is a Catholic church that is uh, named after this saint here, Bernadette Subaru. And she was a she was a well-liked child, energetic, with a witty personality, uh, but they were a poor family and, and not educated. And she had some illnesses. She was asthmatic um, and uh, small of stature, probably because of lack of nutrition. So this, this young, <laughs> popular, intelligent, uneducated young woman at 14 uh, saw an apparition in 1858. And, to her, she was a lady in white. And in all these apparitions, at first, you're not sure who it is that you're seeing. Maybe an angel, maybe some human being. You might be suspecting that it's the Virgin Mary, but not really believe in it. And it, it always develops over time where you talk to the bishops and the priests and, and eventually figure out this is actually Mary talking to you. Um, anyway, so this apparition, this lady in white frightened her and uh, she didn't speak. Uh, Bernadette said the rosary, and um, then three days in a row this happened. This lady came to her three days in a row in the same place, and um, on the third day, the lady spoke to her and told her to come back every day for the next 15 days. In total, Mary appeared to her 20 times, and this occurrence happened lasted until July. So over the next six months, Mary appeared to Bernadette. And she gave Bernadette a mission and she requested that the Bernadette, that Bernadette tell the priest to build a chapel and come in procession to Lourdes. And it is said that this site has healing powers. The waters of Lourdes has um, 
healing powers attributed to it. She was rigorously interviewed by the French authorities and the church, but she, her, her story never wavered in what she spoke. And eventually the church came to believe her. And it was a ninth appearance of Mary to her where they discovered a spring of water in a grotto. And that's, that's the healing waters of Lourdes. You know, on the 16th visit to St. Bernadette, uh, Mary identified herself, calling herself the Immaculate Conception. Which is interesting because that's, that's Immaculate Conception is a strictly Catholic, Roman Catholic thing. The rest of the Christian world uh, doesn't believe in the, including the Episcopal Church officially, although, you know, we're, we're pretty flexible in what people believe. Um, but it's not a part of our official doctrine that the Immaculate Conception, which is a very complicated theology, uh, the Immaculate Conception says that Mary, I, I get confused. Does anybody here know the Immaculate It has to do with her sin. She was born without sin. Born without original. With original sin, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, I've read it before and tried to understand it as a very convoluted. It's very complicated. Yeah, it is. We were taught just to accept it. Yeah, were you? Okay. <laughs> Sort of like marriage. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Bernadette was learned to read at 16, and she became a nun and stayed in the convent for all of her life, uh, dying in 1879. So she didn't live that much longer. That was 17 years later. So she died in her 30s. This is now the Basilica, of course, where Mary appeared to her. And it's a very popular um, Roman Catholic pilgrimage in France. And here's the grotto where you have the healing waters. You can visit the site and you can, you can drink the water. You can, you know, use it like holy water and cross yourself. Or you can take a bath in it if you want to pay the extra and schedule it. So you can bathe in the holy water of the grotto of St. Bernadette or uh, Lord, Lady, Our Lady of Lords. The third Marian apparition is Our Lady of Fatima. Now, now the first two that we just talked about, I could buy them. They're pretty believable. And, and I think that's an interesting question you know I mean I can believe that those first two were true but it doesn't mean I have to be Roman Catholic you know I mean I think God is bigger than any one denomination or even any one line of religion um, and certainly God could appear or St. Mary could appear to people and tell them to build a uh, build a chapel here to inspire and the local people to bring them closer to God, to give them direction and help them to focus on spirituality. And I, I don't know about the Immaculate Conception. And even if Mary did appear to her saying, I am the Immaculate Conception, does that mean the Immaculate Conception is true or does it mean that that was a way of that young woman who's 14 years old understanding and interpreting what's going on. Maybe Mary is using the language that Bernadette understands to try to communicate with her, you know? It's an interesting question about these kinds of miraculous, I mean, I, I think we all question, are these real? Did this really happen? Um, yeah. a lot, sure, a lot of people believe that it did, you know? I'm going to love you and leave you because I'm okay. going to get ready. All right. Church. Yeah, we probably should close it off pretty soon. Um, so this this third one, this third, I'll finish with this third one. It's it's a little sketchier to me compared to the other two Marian apparitions. Uh, it was, Is that because it's in the full room? What's that? Is that because it's a children? oriented uh, appearance or 
parents, I guess. Just I, the children saw saw this happen. Well, I think to me, it's it's the things that the message they received was very specific and narrow, and uh, you know, I don't know, you know. So so Mary appeared to these three girls, uh, Lucia Santos and her cousins, Jacinto and Francisco, and as you see, they were nine, eight, and six years old. And over the course of six appearances, Mary told them three secrets. And it was always on the 13th of the month. One of those, the third secret was not revealed until the, sur the, the last surviving uh, of the girls was, was pretty old. Uh, so on the second visit, Mary told the Marto girls they would be in heaven soon, which is very sad and tragic because they did. They died in the uh, pandemic, the 1918 pandemic. So Francisco Jacinta died in 1918 and uh, only Lucia uh, survived on. She became a Carmelite nun, lived to the age of 97. And she was pretty old when she revealed the third secret. And she revealed it to the Pope. And some of the things that were said to the children, of course, according to the children, you know, the World War I was going on, they said, we can bring an end to the world war, to the great war through praying the rosary. And they said on October 13th, Mary told them on October 13th of that year that she would perform a great miracle. They prophesied, the, uh, Mary prophesied to them that World War II would happen and that Russia would persecute the church. Of course that did become true and that was well before, and World War I was still going on. So that's pretty incredible. And she encouraged them to pray the rosary and uh, be devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And she gave the girls a vision of hell, of tor tormented souls, and telling them, therefore, they need to pray and sacrifice to save people. It seems like a horrible thing to do to children. That's one of the things I don't like about this one. Yeah. Who knows? That's rough. Uh, there was prophecies about Russia becoming communist and spreading their errors throughout the world, which I don't know in that time. In World War I, was Russia already having communist leanings? I, th I, think, the, I think the Bolshevik Revolution had already happened. Um, I think the actual end of the revolution, pretty much when they captured the Tsar, was in 1918. Was it? But, okay. Yeah, they had been having revolutionary stuff for 20 years before. Uh, and then uh, the girls were also given an image of a bishop clothed in white getting shot, which was later interpreted to be the assassination of the attempt of the Pope in 1981. Um, however, uh that's pretty heavy stuff to show little kids. I know, and see, I, I, I like I said, I don't. The, the first two that we talked about, uh, Lord, Our Lady of Lords and Our, Our, Our Lady of um, Guadalupe, I like those two. I, I have a hard time buying into this, but something. Yeah, it, it, it sounds the second point there sounds a little self-serving for the church. It does. It does, and so I don't know. I don't know what really happened with those three girls. And the image of the Pope getting shot, uh, uh, the, the woman told the Pope that uh, when she ha was older, so was it after the fact or before the fact? Well, no, it, 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 she definitely told that before. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I don't know. You know, that's a good question. Um, no, you know what? It was after. Bec here's the thing with that one. Pope John Paul II, that was the third secret that was not told was the image of a bishop clothed in white getting shot. Remember there was three secrets they were told and that was, there was right, right. until she was old. It was, Pope John Paul did not reveal that one until the year 2000. So Pope John Paul II revealed that as the third secret 19 years after, after the event. Hmm. Well, I doubt if he made that up. 
Well, I doubt it too. Point. Yeah, I doubt it too, but it's, to me, some of these things are kind of sketchy, so. Yeah. And, and I would, Religion can do that. <laughs> yeah, right. No you know, it. though, the, one of the things that the Catholic Church did teach me, and I still believe, is that in God, all things are possible. Right. So any of these appearances could be. Yes. Maybe they all are. I don't know. But well, I'm, yeah, I agree with you. And, I, and I'm not saying it's not true. But it, it, you don't know. I think there has, I, I don't understand, uh, I mean, I, I, there must be some sort of interpretation to what happened, maybe that we don't understand, I don't know. Anyway, so Mary had told them there would be a miracle on the October 13th, and this, th there was an event that happened on that day in town. Uh, it was a shared experience by everybody in the crowd. Uh, there was a storm and the clouds cleared, and it appeared to the people there that the sun fell out of the sky. There was a fireball zagging around, shooting colors around. Uh, all the wet clothing and ground immediately dried up. So this was the miracle of the sun on October 13th that happened in that time. Never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah. Dave, before you go, someplace you might want to look into is in Belleville, Illinois, close to St. Louis is our, the Shrine of Our Lady of the Snow. Our Lady of the Snow. Now, there was no visitation that I'm aware of, but they do say that over a million people a year go there. Really? So you might want to look into that. Okay, yeah, I will. All right, so. I don't know the, all the story of it. Let's, uh, let's end this for this week, and we'll, um, We'll continue next week. We'll finish this off next week. Okay, Thank so we're you. starting at 8, 8.30 next week, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean. We'll have a 45 minute social hour and then we can get started. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do tend to talk a lot. Well, like, we like each other and we enjoy the conversations. So. Right? That's right. <laughs> Okay, so right. we're meeting at seven thirty, right? <laughs> okay. All, All right, right, guys. See you next yeah. week. Yeah, Y'all take have care. Last week. You See too. You week. Stay safe. Be well. Bye bye. Bye. bye.